Our guest in this segment is Brian Costello. He is the executive director of the Berkeley County Ambulance Authority. Brian, good morning. Good morning. I think this is the first time we've had you on, isn't it? Uh, no, I think we, it's been a couple of years. A couple years? I was here with my chief, Chad Weinbrenner, a few years oh, ago. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, welcome back. Thank you. You Glad are re back. retired U.S. Army. I am. Yeah. Where did you serve? I was in uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, Germany, Iraq, Afghanistan. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. And uh, lots of EMS experience after that, too. Well, I did, but uh, when I decided to grow up and do a job, this is what I decided to do. <laughs> yeah. I spent uh, 21 years in communications and decided to do this. And nine years now as the executive director of the Ambulance Authority. That's correct. I started July of 2014. What is the role of the Ambulance Authority? Well, we provide the 911 uh, EMS service to Berkeley County. Um, unlike places like patient care transport in uh, Valley, they do the routine facility facility type transports. We're strictly 911 services. So you call 911 dispatch, you need an ambulance, we're the, guy, we're the folks that come to your home. And how are you funded? We're funded two ways, uh, two mechanisms. One's through patient billing. Um, that provides about 50 to 53% of our total income and then through the household fees that we charge annually and uh, something new coming out in january will be a non-residential fee that'll go out to our businesses to help support some of this too i think it was the county council at that time that wanted to pull some of that burden off of the homeowner because the homeowner's been sharing that burden or had that burden ever since it started back in the late 80s early mm -hmm. 90s and how will that work going forward well, what we see is that as an additional revenue stream, and one of the things that it's allowed us to do is to, as you know, July of last year, the county, then county council, elected to increase our ambulance fee. It hadn't been increased since 2011, so they went from $60 a year to 110 annually. So what they decided to do is say, okay, what we'd like to do is start billing non-residential customers and then afford us the opportunity for those uh, members in the community that are homestead exempt through the county tax office, allow us to give them a $25 discount towards their annual um, household fee as long as they remain, you know, uh, homestead exempt. Because we do have some that are exempt for disability and that disability could improve. So that's how we're doing that right now. Billy. Yeah, uh, you said businesses. Uh, what about churches and the nonprofits? Will you also start charging them as well? We do as it's set up. Uh, the, I can't really say nonprofit for sure, but we did look at businesses in general. Uh, we did get some special categories and allowance to, to religious groups, uh, churches, as well as warehouses, because a lot of time, you know, you could have a 30,000 square foot warehouse, but maybe 16 employees. Mm -hmm. And our job really, unlike fire, is not as much structure as mm -hmm. it is the people. So they've given us some latitude to adjust that. I mean, the structure's been done, it's already been approved. Um, we've also looked at a very special rate for our schools. Uh, there's over 2 million square foot of schools throughout Berkeley County. And, uh, you, you know, you have to put something in there with those number of people that you could go to. And what we really did is we looked at the thing as a whole and said, okay, 7% of our call volume goes to businesses or schools or public places. So when we set up this structure, that structure was really based on what our 7% of our operational budget looked like. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, homestead exemption. First, let me applaud you for doing this. I think that it's a very it's a correct move in the right direction. Uh, there has been some confusion, though, with the implementation, and uh, that's, I think, the reason you're on now. Let me, a couple of things, I think, confusion was, uh, uh, does it have to be notarized? And, and because your web page says, web page says something else, and then yet on the radio, it's a, some, uh, it's a different tune altogether. Great question. Um, like anything that you do that's new, you start out with a plan, and that plan is very dynamic, yeah. and that's what it was. We started out to where we said, okay, every odd year we will reassess and have a person uh, fill out the application with us. You know, once you're homestead with the county, you're homestead for good unless it's disability. Every odd year, though. Now, I'm not getting younger. I, so I know. If I'm eligible, why can I? Why do you have to reassess me? Well, here's the good news, and I'm going to answer that too. The good news is, is we've taken away the notary portion of okay. it. You just fill out the paperwork. And I know you know this. The household fee is assessed to a residential address. 
your homestead exemption is given to you as the person. So if you would live at, say, 100 Main Street this year, and then two years from now you live at 200 Main Street, you want your homestead exemption to follow you and not be assigned to that address. Um, so that was one reason to in, in our thought process. The other reason being is a lot of times that what we're seeing is if I'm an elderly person and for whatever reason I go into assisted living, my family in some cases may decide to rent that property out. It remains in my name, but you know, if they were my children, they would rent that out. Well, that, that home would still be receiving the homestead exemption because they don't go into the tax office to redo a deed or the the home never changes hands or anything. So I think what you see there is the fact that there could be some missed revenues or an exemption being given to folks that wouldn't qualify. So that's what the real reason was initially. But I, what I think what I want folks to understand is this is brand new. So we're trying to figure out what is the best way to go forward with this and coming on your show, talking to people in the community gives us the feedback to say, okay, let's pull back. The first thing we did was get rid of that notary. And, and maybe what we do is look at this every five years as a, you know, hey, let's just relook at this every five years, make sure that the right folks are getting what they deserve. But standing in line the other day for well over an hour, I was doing a lot of fuming, saying, why am I having to do this? Uh, so, I, 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 again, I applaud the 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 direction you're going. Uh, I Hopefully you can keep in mind that the elderly population is the one that's been both ta uh, advantaged here and also been taken advantage of. So, I understand. Yeah. Would inconvenience be a better word than taken advantage of? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Inconvenience is a much better word, yeah. So. Exactly. And we, like I said, we anticipated there being some growing pains yeah, and we yeah. will work through those. I mean, I've heard from uh, former Councilwoman Elaine Malk and mm -hmm. others how um, our homebound citizens. Exactly. Um, and, and we understand that those things and, and they're things that when we were building this and putting it together that we thought about, but we just didn't look how in depth that would be. The other thing was, is we, <laughs> we didn't anticipate human nature of folks getting the bill. It's a bill I get every year. I'm going to go ahead and pay it in full. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute. I qualified for this discount. So we had to come up with a way to reimburse these people the excess money that because they, they paid the full 110 when in, in actuality they should have only paid the $85. So like I said, this will be some growing pains. Mm -hmm. uh, we're already working with county IT so that next year, if you're already homestead exempt, you're going to get an $85 bill, not a 110 bill. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're like I said, it's growing. We're making our changes on the fly and hopefully make a better product for yeah. next year. With the IT that we have in this county, and again, led by Gary Wine, we're mm -hmm. one of the leading counties as far as utilizing and taking advantage mm -hmm. of IT. And with the various databases we have, voter registration, mm -hmm. homestead exemption with the assessor's office, there's a lot of ways that changes of status, whether you go from a, a residential to retirement home, this is reflected. Again, voters registration is mm -hmm. one. So I would think there'd be a lot of ways you could integrate these databases to serve your purpose. And you've made a very legitimate claim of what you're trying to do, but you can serve these purposes without inconveniences of the elderly population. Because, gee whiz, at my age, I do not want to be inconvenienced, Rob. I don't blame you, Bill. <laughs> You've, you've earned your time. I've earned my time. You put it in. <laughs> and uh, we are in studio with Brian Costello, Executive Director of the Berkeley County Ambulance Authority. Uh, does any of your funding come from other than the fees and the billings, Brian? Uh, those are only two funding mechanisms we have. We're totally independent of that. And, of course, donations. But usually the donations we put towards employee-based projects because they're the people out there doing the job. But... Uh, you know, we have done grant funding in the past during the COVID time. Um, mm -hmm. We were fortunate recipients to, during that, that time frame, to recover almost over $2 million that would have come, you know, from our budget. So that allowed us, you know, to do some things that we may not have been able to do due to the cost. But uh, those two mechanisms, we take no money from the general funds of the county, unlike, you know, other public safety agencies in the Sheriff's Department. We are totally independent. Um, which I'm proud of that, um, but uh, 
pay our own bills, pay our own way. And of course, as we know, things aren't getting any cheaper. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this year we're looking at about an $8,086,000 million, $86,000 budget. For the what Amazon does plan. a new ambulance cost? Um, depending. If you can afford to purchase it up front, you're looking at about $280,000 just raw ambulance. That's no supplies, no monitors, no equipment, no actual patient care stuff. Um, the biggest thing for us, though, is we just ordered four, and unfortunately, we won't receive the first one until April of 2024, and the remaining three in some time in 2025. So it's... it's uh, the backlog and, and you know the, you have companies out there that felt the squeeze so they're merging and and with some of that free flow money going back and forth a lot of agencies ordered ambulances because we just weren't sure what what the landscape was going to look like so how many manufacturers of ambulances are there oh wow that's a good question uh, and who are are they the major automakers or are they separate uh, in their own entities well you've got independent companies but they rely on you know ford chevy uh, Dodge for their chassis, so you don't know is it is it a building issue because they don't have the workforce or whatever that may be, or uh, there early on it was about chassis. You know they couldn't get the chassis off the, uh, the assembly lines, mm-hmm. uh, but we were fortunate enough to pick up two Ford trucks um, back then, and, and like I said, we had to go through a company called Atlantic out of uh, Hagerstown to order the four that we have on order now. How many do you have total in the entire fleet? I want to say uh, currently right now our rolling stock is 15. Do they vary in type? Uh, they do. We have various Chevys, um, four, but predominantly the, the Force is Ford, um, the uh, F450s. And do they vary based on the call as to what type of ambulance you send out, or are they all pretty similar? No, they're all the same. We have uh, advanced level uh, care as well as basic level care, but all of our ambulances are set up the same. That way, if if I have a basic unit go and then I would need to jump on there, I have advanced level stuff that I can utilize as a paramedic. So they're all set at that level. What is the typical lifespan of an ambulance? Wow, that's a good uh, good question there as well. Um, we set ours at seven years is what we look at. Um, but as call volume increases, uh, when I took this job back in 14, we were running about 7,000, 7,200 calls a year. We now run anywhere between 15, 16,000 a year, transport transport over 8,700 patients to the hospital. So each ambulance is doing 1,000 calls a year. Uh, you're talking about, about 42 calls a day. Yeah, that's a pretty impressive total. It is. It's uh, it's It's been quite a bit, and we've had to grow. When I started, we had four 24-hour ambulances. Now you're looking at... Uh, Seven 24-hour ambulances and two 12-hour ambulances. Brian, how many of your stations are co-located with the fire, fire department? We have, of course, we have our own in north, central, and south of the county. That's 96, 97, 98. Then we co-locate in Back Creek Valley, Station 50. Co-locate for 24 hours at uh, Station 30 in Hedgesville. We have an ambulance that, that co-locates out of the substation on Mid-Atlantic Parkway with Beddington. Um, so those are our predominant places. Now, when Beddington builds, moves and builds a new fire station on uh, Route 11 North, mm-hmm. will you co-locate with them or you keep your separate station? We've had very intermediate talks uh, between the fire board and the ambulance authority to look at either combining that 49 and the 96 crews into that area or whether we keep that 96 crew up north but I, I think the plan is right now strongly, if I could say, is, is to co-locate, co-locate. With something in there. Talk about co-locate, uh, taking it one step farther. There's been a question frequently, why do we have an ambulance and a separate fire department? Why can they not be merged? Well, what you look at with your fire departments today, they're all volunteer. So as we know... Well, not necessarily with Berkeley County. Not, not with the county fire department. Yeah. But, of course, they're utilizing volunteer equipment. They are. Yes, they are. So a volunteer organization is chartered and private by nature. And, therefore, by law and regulatory guidance, they're not – they don't have to adhere to certain things that we, as a government entity and employer, would have to adhere to. So even with some of the things we have today, that can create some issues. So it's – I, I understand what it looks like on the surface, but I think you really need to get underneath and understand that 
what's acceptable and legal under a volunteer private charter is not acceptable and legal under a public entity. Yeah, and you're making a good point that the uh, uh, even though the vol the volunteer fire uh, fighters are being augmented to a large degree by paid, still they're using volunteer equipment. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Brian, go ahead, Bill. No, I was going to say I was, another question that is frequently uh, uh, asked is uh, reimbursement by Medicare. Yes. Medicaid. Uh, what percent of a bill is reimbursed by Medicaid? That's a great question. If you look at advanced level bill to, to Medicare. Advanced level being what now? Um, where you're using either advanced level drugs that require administration okay. by an advanced provider paramedic. Okay. Um, the BLS, of course, is basic, you know, oxygen, yeah. nitrous. about okay. 41 drugs listed in that. Okay. But you look at advanced level care. Um, average advanced level care for us probably receive a bill between, we're going to say between $700 and $800. Of that bill, Medicare only approved what they call usual and customary charges, which is about $329 plus $7.28 a mile. Um, so you take a pretty big hit off of that. Then, then if you have an 80-20 share, 20% of that cost of what they say, hey, 329 or whatever it is, they approve, that comes from the patient. So they cut you a check for their 80%, and they say, okay, go after the patient to get the other 20, whatever the, the, that cost might be. And is that covered through uh, the patient's cost uh, share, with, uh, that covered by Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or some secondary payment? Uh, depending on what that, that provide, what that patient has. Some of them have the supplementals, so mm -hmm. then you hit both their primary and their supplemental uh, to get reimbursement. Uh, we do have our own in-house in billing for BCEA, so... Our girls work very diligently with the patient to make sure that we do everything we can to reduce the cost to them. I have a question for you from our Facebook commenting community. Brian from Brad Knoll, my issue with the fee, if an individual calls an ambulance, they are still charged even though they have fully paid their ambulance fee. That's double dipping. Well, it's, it's not double dipping. Remember, the fee is a readiness fee. Um, that fee nowhere near covers what our operational expenses are and that's what people have to understand uh, i constantly hear about well there's you know thousands of new homes and this and that going in so one of the you know things that came up the other day was you know the gentleman said that with these new homes you should be generating xyz dollars i said look we put about 1800 new homes on a year which generates about one hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars annually that that doesn't even pay for the cost of an ambulance. You have an $8 million you, budget, right? Yeah, you have an $8,086,000 budget to, to, to do that. So I know when we look at things in very simple terms and we look at things to say, hey, this is very much an entitlement that we as human beings deserve in our community. Is, is We have some of the best health care in the world. Unfortunately, it is very expensive. Truth. Hey, from A.R. Emmert, uh, one note, if you live within the city limits of Martinsburg, this fee does not apply to you. This is a county fee. City residents pay through a different process through the city of Martinsburg. That is correct. Uh, we cover everything, and we do have mutual agreements with the city of Martinsburg, but we cover everything except the 17 square miles of the city. They have their own fee, both fire and EMS. Uh, when it comes to uh, capital expenditures like a new ambulance, do you have a separate fund for that, or does it all come out of your $8 million budget? No, it's all set in, it's all set in the budget. Um, if we plan the year prior to say, okay, we're going to invest this, or a lot of times what we do with those big ticket purchases is we have that money set as undesignated funds. And we're like, okay, one of the big things is people think it's, Government business is strange. We're the only businesses that say, okay, we want to spend everything that we make. Mm -hmm. You know, most private business wants to make a profit. We work on a zero-based budget. So it doesn't mean that you can't end up with a net improvement, but that's what we do. When we find ourselves where we have a net improvement, those funds go into, uh, into the, they stay in the same accounts, but they're considered undesignated funds because we're not allocating them towards something as of that time you have you said uh, 14 15 ambulances we do you hope to get about a seven year lifespan out of each which means every year you're trying to replace two trying to replace two yes what happens to the used ambulances once you're done with those well those get surplused out 
and we sell them either through online auction or to local transport companies have a right to, to bid on those on seal bids. So you are recouping some funds from an ambulance? We are. Typically, what can you get for a used ambulance? Uh, the last one we sold online, uh, we took in thirty about $31,000. And what is your personnel situation right now, Brian, in terms of help wanted? This is a difficult time for many to hire people who have specific sets of uh, specific sets of skills yeah as you know um, in our business it's not something that you can do right out of high school you have to go and get some continuing education and a certification so uh, we we employ about 96 full-time employees full and part-time excuse me and uh, those employees of course range from paramedics to advanced EMTs to straight EMTs and uh, we're very fortunate as I said here today we're at full strength. Um, our counterparts near us, they're, they're on the struggle bus, so to say, a little bit trying to do that. But I think that talks about this agency, talks about the leaders that I have in this organization and the way that we do business. And I think they enjoy serving their community is probably the primary reason they do what they do. And what, what is uh, required to get on your staff as an EMT, for instance? What kind of training is involved? Well, they'd have to take an eight-week EMT course. Pass, pass the National Registry certification testing. And then once they do that, they would apply through the West Virginia Office of Emergency Medical Services for a state licensure. So the state will license them. Of course, they go through any other, like any other job, they'll go through the interview process, be selected, and then uh, hire and come on. They'll spend about two months learning our way of doing things. And if all goes well and they do well, then we'll release them to be a full-time provider and continue to monitor and train them and all that stuff. How about a paramedic? Paramedic, that's a, uh, right now you can do a 14-week crash course. Um, we. Uh, What's the difference be between a paramedic uh, and an EMT as far as service provider? Okay. EMT is a basic life support provider. Your advanced EMT is that intermediate group that uh, they have some uh, cardiac things that they can do and additional drugs that they can administer and procedures they can do and then of course your paramedic is your top ALS provider that's in there um, you know they're they're pretty much taking everything pre-hospitally okay. there is a question from Davy Jones who asked if you know how other states provide ambulance service uh, he says I've lived in three different states before I never paid an ambulance fee well, I think what people forget is, you know, around us, your public safety monies are encompassed in your taxes. So that's why their tax base is a little bit higher. In the state of West Virginia, they don't allow for that. Um, there's been questions, you know, why don't we add this to the tax bill or that to the tax bill? The fact is it's illegal in the state of West Virginia to put these things on the tax bill. Excuse so that, me, for the county, you know, For the county, yes. Municipalities do do that. Yeah, okay, they yeah. can do that but the counties cannot. Um, so that's why you're not seeing all that encompassed into your taxes. It's actually set out as fees and, and move from, you know, from there. Now the county does approve one, your budget and also your fee structure. Is that correct? They do approve our fee structure um, over the course of time. Mm -hmm. they, they look at our budget, but they allow the uh, Amos Authority board to do that, okay. the appointed representatives. But they, but the fee structure is under the domain of the county. Yes, 100 okay. percent under the domain of the county. We, you know, we brief, make recommendations, and then they choose to either mm -hmm. accept or decline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people were talking about well, you increased last year, and then this year. Well, that was because when we went in July of 2022, we asked, hey, let's don't have the folks bite the whole big cost of this off right now. Let's phase it in over. We originally asked for three years, and they said, hey, let's do it in two. Yeah. Brian, anything else our audience should know uh, in regards to the fees or the uh, homestead exemption? Well, if they have questions about their fees or that exemption, they can always call our office at 304-264-1921. Uh, um, they can reach out to me at my email if they so choose, if they'd like to use that, that media source. It's bcostello at berkeleywv.org. Um, I'll do my best to answer any questions you, that you have or any concerns that you want to share or maybe just have recommendations on how we make it better. Okay. One, uh, to repeat what we said earlier, uh, the 
the web page said this should be notarized, but that's no longer required. That is no longer required, yeah. and it's, it's my understanding that that came down. Okay, good. Yeah, because that was the reason that I got in line, because mm -hmm. I did not want to pay $50 for a $25 uh, reimbursement, and so I to avoid being notarized. But that's no longer an issue. That is no longer okay. an issue, no, sir. Yeah. And, Brian, next year at this time, you anticipate that the bill will just be the appropriate amount as opposed to needing to get a refund? Our, our hope is, is that through the work that we'll do over this next year, if you're already homestead exempt, you'll get that $85 bill versus a 110 But if you do... Please reach out to us, contact us, so that we can get it corrected. Brian, thanks so much for coming in. Very Thank much appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Always Brian. good to have Thank another you. Italian in the studio, Bill. <laughs> Makes me feel safe. Yes, me too. I feel much better now. <laughs>